Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Here are the stories we're following today. Karen, we begin with the criminal hush money trial of Donald Trump. Jurors are expected to begin deliberations today. Let's get the latest from Bloomberg's John Tucker in New York. John. Nathan, after more than six weeks of testimony, closing arguments wrapped up last night. The prosecutor urging the Manhattan jury to consider what he called a mountain of evidence showing the former president tried to influence the 2016 election by paying a porn actress to stay silent silent about an alleged sexual encounter and then trying to cover his tracks. This morning, Judge Juan Marchand will give the 12-person panel instructions on how to apply the law to the case, known as a jury charge, and then will send them to the jury room to begin deliberations. Trump faces 34 counts of falsifying business records. If he's found guilty of any of the counts, the next step will be for the judge to sentence him. A typical defendant convicted of a felony charge is sentenced to serve some prison time, but there's nothing in the law that requires it. Each of the counts is an E-class felony, which carries a prison term of one and a third years to four years. The judge has made it clear he takes white-collar crime seriously. In New York, I'm John Tucker, Bloomberg Radio. All right, John, thank you. We now turn to the latest developments in the Middle East. The White House says an Israeli strike on an encampment in Rafah that left dozens dead was devastating, but did not cross the red line. Bloomberg's Ed Baxter reports. The administration says the president has no intention of freezing additional arms shipments. NSC spokesman John Kirby says it was not the large-scale attack that U.S. had warned against. We have been, I think, very strident uh, in our condemnations about the deaths of innocent civilians. These deaths are not excused from that. Uh, But we have to understand what happened here. Now, Israel, in fact, says its small arms airdrop could not have caused the explosion that killed dozens. It says it had to have been Hamas stored munitions. Ed Baxter, Bloomberg Radio. Thanks, Ed. Turning to markets now, futures are lower ahead of the Wednesday session on concern about rates impacting investors. Yesterday, the Fed's Neil Kashkari said officials have not entirely ruled out additional rate hikes. Lori Calvacina is head of U.S. equity strategy at RBC Capital Markets. We do think based on sort of the messaging of where, you know, the economy is likely to be this year, what the Fed is likely to do or not do this year, and where inflation is likely to end up, we seem fairly valued. And I know that's a little bit of a boring message, but we do feel a little bit stuck in neutral for the moment. Um, I will say I am not in the bearish camp. Um, We do have a few strategists who who are still sitting over there. And we do think that we're sort of midway through a recovery that begin off recession-like conditions in 2022. Um, But sometimes we do get a little bit stuck in the market. Market, and that's how I'm feeling at the moment. Lori Calvacina of RBC Capital Market says her year-end price target for the S&P 500 is 5,300. That's just a few points from where it closed yesterday. Well, we have plenty of deal news to get you caught up on, Nathan. The Financial Times is reporting ConocoPhillips is in advance talks to acquire smaller rival Marathon Oil. The paper says the proposed all-stock deal would value Marathon at more than $15 billion. Shares of Marathon are up more than 5%. In Europe, Karen, BHP has asked for a deadline extension on its takeover talks of rival Anglo-American. The miner says it's proposed a range of measures intended to address concerns regarding the proposed transaction structure. BHP HP's third all-share proposal, valuing Anglo at $49 billion, was rebuffed last week. And in the drug industry, Nathan, Merck is reportedly buying privately held iBio. The FT says the price tag is $3 billion. The paper says the acquisition pushes Merck into the growing market for eye care. And in other company news, Karen, we're watching shares of American Airlines fly lower. They are down nearly 8%. The airline cut its profit guidance heading into the crucial summer travel season. American also says its chief commercial officer is leaving the company. Well, we turn to Asia now, Nathan. The Chinese economy is getting a boost from the International Monetary Fund. It's raising its growth forecast this year for the world's second biggest economy to 5 percent. That's up from 4.6 percent just a few weeks ago. Gita Gopinath is the IMF's first deputy managing director. She says 2024 has gotten off to a strong start in China. We certainly are seeing that consumption is recovering, but still it has some ways to go. The the strength we're seeing in public investment remains. Private investment is still weak, mainly because of the weakness in the property sector. 
The IMF's Gita Gopinath is calling on China to provide more fiscal and monetary support for its economy, including more steps to resolve the housing crisis. This month, China announced easier down payment requirements for home buyers and about $42 billion in central bank funding to help local governments buy excess properties. Well, back here in the U.S., Karen, the short seller who made his fame and fortune off the collapse of Enron is now facing a lawsuit from one of his partners. Jim Chanos, the founder of Chanos & Company, is accused of taking $10 million in loans from the company over more than a decade and using them as a, quote, piggy bank. The lawsuit from Conlon Holdings also accuses Chanos of selling a Miami luxury apartment for $17.8 million and then using his girlfriend as the sales agent, netting her a more than half million dollar commission. Chanos tells Bloomberg the lawsuit is puzzling and baseless. It is time now for a look at some of the other stories making news in New York and around the world. And for that, we're joined by Bloomberg's Michael Barr. Michael, good morning. Good morning, Karen. Harvey Weinstein is expected to appear before a judge this afternoon in the same New York City courthouse where former President Donald Trump is on trial. The disgraced movie producer is awaiting a retrial on rape charges after his 2020 conviction was tossed out. Today's court hearing will address various legal issues related to the upcoming trial, which is tentatively scheduled for some time after Labor Day. Two people were missing and seven were injured when a natural gas explosion caused extensive damage to a building in downtown Youngstown, Ohio. Authorities say yesterday afternoon's blast blew off the facade of Realty Tower. Firefighters helped some people get out of the building, which houses a Chase Bank on the ground floor and has apartments in upper floors. This man works a block away from the blast. It sounded like a big piece of machinery like fell flat onto the, onto the side street. That's how it sounded. And then you got a little shake with it. So it, my initial thought is like, I've been in an earthquake before. I was like, is this an earthquake? Fire officials say the building's structural integrity is in question, so no firefighters are being allowed in to conduct a search. A Texas Republican congressman representing the Uvalde area won in a tense runoff with a gun rights activist in the state's primary. GOP Congressman Tony Gonzalez was one of the few congressional Republicans who supported the 2022 bipartisan gun law created in the wake of the brutal shooting in his district at Robb Elementary. Gonzalez got 50 50.7% to Brandon Herrera, a gun rights YouTuber, at 49.3%. The number of global executions on death rows around the world are going up. However, according to a report from Amnesty International, the number of countries carrying out the executions is going down. Researcher Justin Mazzola believes the push to abolish the death penalty must continue, even as many states in the U.S. look for new methods to carry out executions. Now that it's been harder for folks to get, um, for states to uh, obtain lethal injection drugs, what we're seeing is more experimentation in terms of the drugs that they're using, uh, which has been leading to more botched executions, um, as well as, you know, trying new methods or, or reverting to archaic methods such as firing squads. Researcher Justin Mazzola with Amnesty International. Global news 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr and this is Bloomberg. Karen. All right, Michael, thank you. And it's time now for the Bloomberg Sports Update with John Stashauer. John, good morning. Good morning, Karen. The Rangers went to game four at Florida, coming off back-to-back overtime wins for their last five Stanley Cup playoff victories that come in OT. Another game where 60 minutes, not enough, but early in overtime, Florida was on the power play. Ryan Hart back out to Verhage across Montour. Kachuk right side, half court, down to the line. Montour down low, bar coming from right on a shot. And he scores! The overtime winner here in game four in this series is tied. Sam Ryan Hart from right out in front. WQAM, the call. Panthers scoring just a minute 13 in. Can't blame Igor Sisterkin. He made 37 saves. Rangers got goals from Vincent Trocek and Alexis Lafreniere. But four games into the series, still no points. For either Chris Kreider or his line mate Mika Zibanejad, still no goals for Artemi Panarin. Game five at the Garden tomorrow night. There's never been an NBA playoff with two conference final sweeps, and there still has not been. Minnesota stayed alive. A game four win in Dallas, 105 to 100. The Mavs still lead the series three to one. Yankees at the Angels, who are 12 under 500, and only won six home games all season. The Angels won. 
Four to three on a Taylor Ward two-run double eighth inning off Clay Holmes. Juan Soto, a long first inning homer for the Yanks. Anthony Volpe extended his hitting streak to 20. DJ LeMay, who back from injury, played for the first time this season. Long day for the Mets. Francisco Lindor, two-run homer, third inning of the opener of the doubleheader, and the Mets were held scoreless for the next 16 innings. Lost to the Dodgers 5-2 to two in 10, and then 3 nothing in the nightcap, and the Mets have now lost seven of their last eight. 14 of their last 18. Red Sox 1-8-3 at Baltimore. The Nationals shut out in Atlanta 2-0. The Giants a 1-0 10-inning win over the Phillies. Novak Djokovic has not won a tournament or even reached a final this year, but he has won 24 career Grand Slams, and he won his opening round match at the French Open in straight sets. John Stash Network, Bloomberg Sports, Kevin and Nathan. Coast to coast on Bloomberg Radio, nationwide on Sirius XM, and around the world on Bloomberg.com and the Bloomberg Business app. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. Well, after more than six weeks of proceedings, a long day and night of closing arguments and a litany of complaints from Donald Trump, the first ever criminal trial of a former president is about to go to the jury. And joining us now for more on this is Greg Vallier, Chief U.S. Policy Strategist at AGF Investments. Greg, good morning. We did see prosecutors spend all day and much of the night going through the evidence with the jury. Where do you see this thing going now that deliberations are about to begin? Yeah, good morning, Nathan. I mean, everyone has a forecast, and I do too. Mine is that this is going to drag on for uh, quite some time uh, with maybe a juror or two holding out and that maybe there'll be some guilty verdicts. Maybe there'll be also some not guilty verdicts uh, together. But I think we got a ways to go. That could spell what? Uh, something positive for the president, you would think. If jury deliberations go on for quite some time, it raises the possibility of reasonable doubt, does it not? Yeah, I think so. And I think it also would reinforce his really expert ability to play the martyr. I think he's going to continue to say that this is an unfair witch hunt. I think that he runs the risk still of a uh, violating the gag order. You know, if he violated that, Nathan, and, and had to serve a day or two in jail, I have a hunch, uh, being a contrarian, that uh, Trump would love it. It would, it would boost his support among his base. It would be great publicity. Uh, it again would make him look like a martyr. So I don't, I don't rule out some uh, off, the, you know, outside the box move by the judge to say you violated the gag order. Yeah, it does uh, raise the question about what that would mean for the independent vote to bring it into the crass realm of political impact of a case like this when you have the, you know, the serious nature of felony charges against a former president. But uh, where do you see things going if we do see the former president behind bars for whatever reason and, you know, potentially heading into a November election with felony convictions on his record. Yeah, we're in such uncharted waters and obviously unprecedented, so it's hard to make a, uh, an accurate prediction. I, I would say that if he is found guilty, he'll appeal. And he's great at appealing, delaying, delaying, delaying. So I think he would appeal, and, and an appeal would go well into 2025. Could he serve as president with an appeal? Yeah, I think he could. I wonder what you made as well of the Biden campaign taking advantage of the media spectacle around the case yesterday and bringing out Robert De Niro and January 6th first responders to uh, put the focus on what the president has been running on. Well, since 2016, the potential threat to democracy that he sees from former President Trump. Yeah, it, it's an argument they can make, but I thought yesterday was a spectacle. I think they they didn't exactly help themselves uh, with De Niro's comments, uh, but this this will go on. I think there's also going to be a focus on what Trump said a couple of days ago, that the judges are, uh, what he called them, a human scum. I mean, you, you make charges like that. I, I think Trump's biggest flaw right now is Donald Trump. I think that he... Uh, 
He is so he has no filter whatsoever, and I think that will continue. I think a lot of moderate voters are going to get tired after a while of nonstop Trump controversy. We're not there yet, but I think by the end of the summer, people may say enough is enough. It's something to say to say that we're not there yet after all these weeks of testimony. But in the time that we have left, Greg, I want to get your thoughts on what we heard from the White House yesterday and the uh, strike on the camp in Rafa not crossing the White House's red line. Yeah, I mean, presidents in recent uh, history have had problems with red lines. Barack Obama had a problem with uh, crossing the line, and he looked bad. Uh, I, I do think that the U.S. Israeli relationship will continue to deteriorate. I never thought I would see a U.S. president and an Israeli prime minister that are estranged, and the two of them are virtually estranged right now. This kind of estrangement, does it have a political impact on President Biden? We've got about 30 seconds left. Yeah, it doesn't help him. Everywhere you look, Nathan, this this stuff that I think does not help uh, Biden. Biden's lucky he's only down by, you know, one or two or three points. But the momentum in the big battleground states are, is, is with Trump. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Today, your morning brief on the stories making news from Wall Street to Washington and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed at 6 a.m. Eastern each morning on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning starting at 5 a.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak.